Ladies and gentlemen, I am Paul, U.S. Army combat veteran, and today we are taking a look at a Seth review. That's right. Buckle up, nerds. It's going to be Dwarf, d Dwarf, d fuck. Dwarf Fortress review. I can't even talk. This is, this is, but buckle up. This is only going to go downhill from here. Let's do it. People, Seth here. Today, I'll be covering a long-running cult classic that's still updated and developed to this very day. A game- now, Why is it that Seth always seems to gravitate to cults? Or at least games that create cults? Or about cults? Or developed by cults? Or trying to summon an ancient deity as part of a cult? The point is, Seth seems to love these things. And I'm, I'm here to tell you guys, if you're, if you're a cult nerd, well, <sighs> You know, cults, cults actually target a very specific type of person. And oftentimes, these actually aren't the very poor who realize that, that the subjective stuff cults can offer them aren't very useful, right? Self-actualization is not something you need when you don't have a place to live or food to eat. And they don't target the very rich because usually when you're very rich, uh, you learn how to discern real value from a scam. Otherwise, you don't stay rich for very long. Uh, so instead, they target middle-class people. Uh, and usually they're middle-class people who have most of their basic needs met, but still feel like they have some sort of unresolved or some sort of like personal empathy emptiness. And in order to uh, compensate for that, that's where the cult leader tends to worm their way in. In which chronicles the lives and accomplishments of stumpy alcoholics as they struggle to avoid sobriety. A game where the most ludicrous events take place daily, where civilizations rise and fall just because someone left a Necronomicon in the public library. A game- Wait, 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 wait. Let's back up on what other cursed books exist in this library. Uh, whoa, can't say that book there. Um, okay. Uh, bread by the Ogres, uh, Erotica, Bagged Grocery 5, How to Avoid Huge Ships, How to Avoid Huge Ships 2, Infinite Jest, Atlas Shrugged, Broodmaiden for the Centaur. Shout out to Seth for knowing that there was a time, and of course, Atlas Shrugged, the most cursed book of all. Shout out to Seth for knowing that in the mid to, or really between about 2015 and 2000, and I'm going to say 18, uh, Amazon was allowing people to self publish any book they wanted. And Obviously, uh, every person with an axe to grind or uh, a frightening manifesto or just sort of long-winded treatise that didn't make any sense, all published on Amazon. But there were a group of savvy entrepreneurs who realized that while most people won't touch a self-published book for the obvious reasons that it's mostly the unhinged rantings of a madman who's likely abusing meth, uh, there was a subset of people who would purchase a self-published book, and that is fetishists. Just like furry art, where it practically sells itself, very specific fetish uh, uh, erotica, as it came to be known, uh, could actually be extremely profitable. See, here's the thing. If you're a major publishing house, you know that 90, you know, let's say, let's even be not that generous. About 65% of women want to be swept away, taken by the vice count, right? But a subset of women are like, uh, women and men, frankly, I, I think this is this is me uh, being, you know, gender normative. Women and men, a, a subset of them, are real dyed-in-the-wool degenerates, right? They don't want to be, a, 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 you know, a na uh, innocent waif taken by a lusty, uh, you know, uh, prince or, or celebrity or something. No, they're like, listen, my romantic desires are for centaurs, ogres, bagged groceries, right? And when you have those uh, desires, right? There's you can't. There the centaurs don't even exist, so you certainly aren't going to see any uh, uh, P O R N of it. But lo and behold, those authors can make that weird fantasy come to life. And so, sure enough, this was sort of the cash grab, the money maker of the self-publishing world. Uh, 
It was weird and it digressed into parody. You ended up actually with one of these novels nominated for a Hugo Award. This is sort of its own story, but basically what happened is, uh, uh, let's see if I can uh, explain it uh, shortly. All right, so what happened was is that uh, like a lot of, uh, here's, here's a good news story. Yeah, here we go. Is Chuck Tingle and his Hugo nominated dinosaur erotica a sad puppy's plant? Okay, so in 2016, right, uh, Hugo, there was, of course, a movement among writers to sort of do what sci fi does best, which is take the issues the real world is struggling with and reframe them using uh, the fantastic world of science fiction to sometimes create extreme versions or parodies or explorations that we can't do in the real world for a variety of reasons. And this was no different. In 2016, one of the biggest controversies were things like uh, uh, gender, identity, inclusion, marginalization, you know, kind of uh, what are now sort of like overused Twitter buzzwords, but you know, at the time they were seen as important touchstones to the co to the conversation and to literature. Well, a subset of people thought these were dumb. Um, and so the Hugo Awards, uh, the top science fiction, you know, the uh, award in the world, um, a past, here's, here's actually a good summary. The past few years, so uh, 2016, a few years, group calling itself the Sad Puppies tried to take over the world and, quote, make sci-fi great again. I don't know if that's an actual quote. Uh, it says stamp out growing diversity. Uh, I think they mean just like stamp, stamp out the discussion of like these sort of, you know, the uh, diversity, marginalization, identity, gender. Um, and right, the obviously some people think this is a reaction. Uh, I believe in my personal opinion, whether you like it or not, uh, you know, there's nothing wrong. Science fiction, the whole point is to explore stuff that makes people uncomfortable in ways that makes them uncomfortable. That's why you have aliens do it and not, you know, regular people. Um, a lot of people have opinions about it, but there is speculation that this group in protest actually nominated uh, this erotic author, Chuck Tingle, who pop, who wrote such popular hits as Taken by the Gay Unicorn Biker, I'm Gay for the Living Billionaire Jet Plane, Gay T-Rex Law Firm, all right, I can't read that last part. Uh, so they interviewed Chuck Tingle, and <laughs> also he is uh, <laughs> uh, just, oh, he seems like he's just a weirdo. Anyway, the point is this really happened. And anyway, this was like the high water mark of the world of uh, self-published erotica. So there's that. I hope I'm glad. I hope you informed that because it definitely cost me my monetization. Uh, let's get back. To Seth. A game where the UI is so useless and convoluted that you'd honestly have an easier time playing Microsoft Excel. Let's get your ass back. I'm a performance artist. Deep, dark fantasy. <laughs> well, okay, Seth just taking us through his the deepest corners of his mind, of his psyche. This is how the cult leader gets you, right? And they 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 hypnotize you take you through your psyche you're gonna gain insight into yourself that you never thought was possible right you're gonna you're gonna become actualized you're gonna become the best version of yourself right and it, it you know that feeling of 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 being unsure of what you want to do that feeling of discontentedness that basically every author has written about since about the middle ages that feeling is something this cult leader can fix even though you've never heard of them and they are an obscure spiritual uh, guru uh, they definitely know the answers that no other human being has been able to find. Boy. Oh, my shoulder. He 
it. Well, okay. I'm speaking, of course, about Dwarf Fortress. Dwarf Fortress is less of a game and more of a complex fantasy world simulation made by one guy over 20 years and probably for the rest of his natural and unnatural lifespan oh, as we Jesus. plan to crowdfund Tarn Adams a synthetic body so he can focus on what truly matters. Dwarf Fortress really is one of the greatest autism projects to ever blossom. Fun fact, it's also the hardest game to run on PC, even an i7 Pro. Wait, really? I, I I feel like that could be true, but I don't know. Sasser chokes and dies the moment you forget to sterilize your cats. If not for the oh, it's because it's not. It's because there's some sort of error that just runs the processor forever. Ever increasing technological demands of Dwarf Fortress, AMD, and Intel would be bankrupt right now. To even begin, <laughs> I love like how it refers to them as Tencent. Dwarf Fortress, you'll need some prison. Okay, this is an, uh, a comparison if you guys don't get the joke. It's because a lot of, so in the US, if you want to become a publicly traded company on a major exchange, uh, you need to pass some really diligent disclosure requirements and auditing requirements. So you have to have an independent auditor come in and certify that you really are the company you say you are. And the reason is because this reduces fraud, right? People are less likely to fraudulently, uh, you know, you're, it's, it's harder to commit fraud when someone has actually sat down and made sure when you say, hey, we're a billion dollar company that you actually can show a billion dollars, right? Of valuation or whatever. But in China, it's a little different. And that's and the reason the US regulates the shit out of the stock market is because that's the primary vehicle for, well, wealth generation in the country, right? That's what all our retirement accounts are in. Uh, but in China, uh, the primary vehicle for wealth and savings and, and long-term security is actually real estate. And that's, if you've seen any Graham Stephan video in the past uh, month, you know that that's got its own host of problems, but uh, crucially, it means that the stock market is a little bit like real estate here. Uh, real estate's kind of weird. There's a bunch of Wild West. There's a bunch of scammers, right? Uh, it's a little, it's a lot harder to navigate. Well, that's what the stock market is in China. It's an obscure money-making field that some people make a lot of money, but a lot of people just find Byzantine and confusing. And that means that a lot of these companies, the general consensus is, is that they, whatever they claim they make, or they claim their valuation is, or they claim their profitability is, is basically bullshit. It's basically like total fucking lies. So in conclusion, don't believe anything the Chinese stock market people tell you. Prescription medication. But more importantly, you'll need a world to play in. So we create one, we set some parameters, and the game will then calculate 250 fucking years of history for this randomly generated world. And depending on your computer, this may also take 250 years. Once the world is made, it's all yours. And like an abusive lover, she will caress and beat you senseless. Jesus. And each time you I mean yeah, this is a real like autism project to just be like, we won't just generate random events and let you, the player, just sort of spitball why they occurred. Uh, no, we're going to actually run these histories. We'll come back for more. There's two main game modes you can play in Dwarf Fortress. You histories of greed and dynamism. Is that? Oh my god, histories of greed and dynamism. I love it. Dwarf Fortress. You can either choose to embark on distant lands and lead a fortress to ruin, or die horrifically in the pursuit of adventure. To begin, let's cover fortress mode first. All you have to do is pick a nice place to embark, and that's about it. Despite common myths, Dwarf Fortress isn't complicated. Just follow a couple of tutorials and you'll be a seasoned veteran in no time. You should also download and use the Lazy Noob Pack, because the game is almost unplayable without it. Some may disagree with this statement, but to put it simply, they're fucking wrong. These same people will disagree with my choice of tile set, or the fact that I use a tile set at all. To answer these concerns and make this video that much- Oh my god, I- okay. One of the things that I hate more than anything else on earth is people who believe that the worse the UI is, the, the better you are at something. Like when people are like, I don't want a tile set. I just want numbers on a screen, right? Like, look at this, this is hideous. Why would I stare at this all day if I had any choice at all, right? But some people just believe that. They're like, if I'm not uncomfortable, if my UI isn't hot fucking garbage, then I'm wasting my time. Colors distract the two neurons in my brain not devoted to calculating this game. And it's like, Fuck, dude, just relax. It's a game.
easier to watch, I will be using all of the time. So to be fair, this isn't exclusive to gaming, right? Uh, look at how many backpackers or scuba divers are like, oh, you bring X on your trips. It's an extra three ounces that you have to carry around. I don't do that. I just, I don't, I don't dig my poop holes. I just use a rock. Uh, who, who brings a poop shovel? I'll set it. You brush your teeth. Uh, huh, that's stupid. Everybody knows that. I just, I just, I just rub pine needles on my on my gums. It, 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 it's just as good, and I don't need to waste my weight bringing two ounces of toothpaste. <laughs> random in fortress mode sorry you that's my roast of ultralight backpackers if i understand if you have no idea what i'm talking about you start out with seven dwarves given the difficult task of establishing civilization the longer you survive and flourish the more migrants will arrive from neighboring cities attracted by the promise of your growing fortress okay listen let all right you can't build a civilization with just seven people. And this doesn't, I understand, right? This this person seems committed to doing things realistically, as realistic as you can get given, uh, you know, uh, uh, two foot tall demi-humans living in rocks. But if you have a seven person population, there is a minimum necessary amount of genetic diversity that is required to create a viable population, right? If you have two rabbits, right? Those rabbit, that rabbit population that you breed will, it, you'll run into the same problem as, well, if you had two humans that tried to make a civilization, it would just run out of, well, genetic diversity, right? Because think about it. The first generation after that has to have siblings reproducing with siblings. It's more than a little problematic. The next generation, almost everyone is going to be a sibling producing reproducing with a sibling or cousin right and you see how instead you need increasing amounts of genetic diversity to make these populations thrive there's a certain baseline level that you need and seven is not that level i think the actual number is like 20 um like 10 male 10 female i think that will produce enough genetic diversity that you never run into um multiple generations of like dangerously closely related people uh, but even then you still have things like genetic traits where a, a person can be really susceptible to um you know to certain diseases right like you may just not have you may just let's say you have the genetic code that makes you really just totally flattened you know like 80 percent fatality rate to uh, a chicken pox, right? A, a, a disease that, you know, only a tiny minority of people are ever like in serious danger of. Um, what is it called when you're an adult? It's called like something else as an adult. But the point is, is that if you don't have that genetic diversity where you're resilient to a bunch of diseases, your population risks being wiped out by a single problematic uh, illness. From there on, this is why populations of like trees where they're all genetically the same are actually prone to sometimes really devastating diseases. Any number of things can happen. Disaster, tragedy, invasions, and tantrum spirals which threaten to end your fort at any given moment. But whether you live or die, just remember, losing is fun. It's impossible to cover everything. So, let me tell you some stories. The first fortress I ever founded was absolutely terrible. We had no metal, so instead we fought with sticks and traded pottery for any possible scrap of metal. We also lived in constant fear. There was a were zebra on the loose. He kept eating my chickens and trampling my dwarves as if chickens. Mm. What are my chickens doing? Oh my, my chickens are losing their minds. Um, I should, I, I, I wish I could show you a picture. Uh, what they, because we are planting a new garden bed and right now it is just all empty soft soil. And chickens, if you don't know, love digging in soft soil, like a lot. So right now, all of them, they also bathe in it. All of them are just rolling around in this garden bed, um, just loving life. If I couldn't, so if a were zebra ate them, I would be so angry. 
escape the furry menace in real life, it torments me in my video games as well. It turned out that the were zebra was a human musician who plays at my tavern, so I let him stay and snap a few chicken necks every month. The place was actually quite successful. Five years on and no major invasions, what the hell? I asked my friend who knows Dwarf Fortress to take a look. He came back shocked and told me, you're not at war with the goblins. How? I had no idea. My fortress was a place of culture and learning, of drunken revelry and international diplomatic renown. Life proceeded as normal. And then, one day, one of my guests of honor, a legendary human wrestler, had too much to drink and went into a murderous rage. He proceeded to grab a goblin dancer and pulled off her lower jaw. As she was screaming, he began- This is really specific. I can't tell how much is just Seth adding, like, like, superfluous detail to make things really pop. Like, did he- just it was it just like goblin wounded or was it literally like lower jaw goblin dancer injured wrestler manic rampage thrashing her with her own jawbone. The situation quickly deteriorated as she retaliated back. My other dwarves, upon seeing that a man was under attack and, fearing for his life, used appropriate self-defense to remove the assailant's ability to chew food, launched into a furious brawl. It was a bloodbath that marked the beginning. Wait, what? Oh my gosh, no, this is exactly what happened. The dancer punches the siege operator in the right upper arm with her right hand, bruising the fat through the river otter leather cloak jesus the siege operator scratches the dancer in the head bruising the muscle through the donkey leather hood the dancer misses the siege operator the dancer attacks the siege operator the siege operator attacks the dancer but she jumps away the dancer attacks the siege operator but she jumps away oh my god Beginning of a race riots, every goblin in my fortress was slaughtered. For our acts of racial cleansing, the goblins had declared war on us. One we couldn't- Ooh, racial cleansing, that's another good one. If you've been in this channel for more than 30 seconds, you know one of the things I have, I have max saltiness about is the invention of the term ethnic cleansing. See, after World War II, uh, the UN, all nations signed a treaty that said, listen, we know that for, you know, it's something like a thousand years uh, we have had, or 500 years, uh, the international order has been predicated on this idea that what goes on in your country is your business, and we engage with the legitimate rulers of those countries right, on a basis of peers. But uh, there's one exception we carved out after 1945 that said if you try to genocide an entire people group, you cannot do that. We, the international community, will reserve the right to intervene to protect an entire peoples from genocide. But the problem is you've got to remember that reality always gets a vote. And so in the 90s, you had a, uh, uh, let's try to think of a nice way of putting this. You had a bunch of conflicts in the Balkans that included a powerful group trying to exterminate an ethnic and religious minority. This, of course, sounds a lot like that, like genocide, the thing that the treaty said we can't do. And so, and they realized the international community was like, oh snap, we actually have to like put up or shut up. We actually have to send our troops in to stabilize this weird conflict in a place where we have no major interests at stake. And so we decided instead that we were going to invent a new word. We're going to invent the term ethnic cleansing. And as long as what happened was ethnic cleansing, then it didn't violate the treaty and nations could all look the other way. And so that's what we did in Rwanda, in Serbia, Kosovo, right? We, we did it everywhere. Everywhere we could get away with it. We being the entire international community. Uh, the, the, the Saddam did it to the Kurds. We pretended that didn't happen. You know, we, we just, it's a, it's a winning strategy. Once you just invent a new word for the same thing, you can get away with it. And so I appreciate that Seth is out here doing, doing that in the finest traditions win. And all because some retard couldn't handle his mushroom wine. Several months later, my fortress was swallowed by the Green Horde. Those who weren't murdered walled themselves off, went crazy and consumed each other. The rest starved to death. Dwarf Fortress, a fun, light-hearted experience for the whole family. My second- Just want to point something out, you can't, you can't make mushroom wine. I mean, you could, but- 
the fermentation process of wine is when you have these bacteria, they consume sugars and they spit out alcohol and CO2. If you don't have sugars in a food product, it cannot be turned into wine. Even things like barley, uh, wheat, right? That, that has some base sugar in it. See, corn syrup, right? Uh, but without that base sugar, you're never gonna be able to convert it into wine. In Fortress fared slightly so One of the first fermented drinks was actually honey wine. Better, until I dug too deep. My third, well, we all know how this ends already, right? One of my dwarves got possessed, so I walled off his workshop, forgot about it, and accidentally opened up his crypt. In the middle of town, the nauseous fumes from his hot, decomposing body erupted across several levels, driving everyone insane from the sight and stench of his swollen c Jesus. Whoa. A pool of magic, the Icelander's dwarf blood. A pool of Megadev X's dwarf blood. Daver. In the chaos, a mother dropped her toddler into a shallow pool of water. The child drowned, causing the mother to go into a tantrum and attack an experienced axe dwarf, who decapitated her. The dead bodies huh. caused more tantrums, which would result in even more dead bodies, which eventually reduced my population to a single person, a single axe dwarf, who was now considered legendary, having gained enough experience from beheading everybody else. My fourth attempt was actually... <laughs> Okay, that actually is also sometimes how things can go. In the old uh, history by Thucydides, he discusses this in which towns would... Uh going through some sort of big tectonic shift in their in their politics uh would actually become sort of consumed he would call it like a madness right and it was this idea that everyone saw enemies everywhere uh, internal and external and once that social fabric of trust began to break down you would see exactly what he's describing here this constant cycle of violence and retribution you saw it in for example iraq between about 2006 and 2010 and then again between 2000 12 and 2018 but the point is is that this was this is sort of how things go right you reach a point in which you view all of your neighbors and fellow uh, people you you previously got along with as being hostile and suddenly it takes even just minor incursions for you to uh feel you need to protect yourself fine the fortress still stands as a grisly reminder of why we have health and safety i read online somewhere that you could train your dwarves extremely quickly by constructing a danger room the idea is simple we put a dwarf in a room filled with traps we activate them and our brave warriors will gracefully dodge and block every single one of them but this process wasn't fast enough so we replaced the traps with coins. We hit the lever and 500 freshly minted coins would harmlessly ricochet at high speed across the room, turning our dwarves into professional soldiers instantly. However, it didn't work. 500 coins suddenly ricocheted at high speed and destroyed my dwarf's windpipe. Even the best surgeons available couldn't operate quick enough. <laughs> wow. Training spear strikes axe dwarf lower body. The attack is deflected by the axe dwarf steel chain leggings. The willow is training spear strikes axe dwarf. Jesus Christ. For a store the fact they have this AI generated narrative text seems incredibly tedious. Oxygen supply. The cause of death was ruled to be asphyxiation by legal tender. Not to be dissuaded, I tried to optimize coin training. I made my men wear five layers of cotton around their necks. The results, several women were now widows and about a dozen and men were now buried without a throat. It turns out coins are very dangerous. Attempt number five, my current and final fortress. One day, I receive a notification. One of my master engravers had just sculpted a masterpiece on the dining room wall. I find the engraving and read the description. He just sculpted Engraved on the walls, an exceptionally designed image of Alumethi Kolostat, the dwarf and Osmodi Kiltrin, the dwarf by Alamethy Kolstad. Alamethy Kolstad is striking down, striking down Osmo, Osmodi Kilrutan. The artwork relates the killing of Osmodi Kilrutan by Alamuthi Kolstad in Kazagam in mid autumn of 261. Oh, okay, I see. It's describing what he's depicting. And it's called the Jubilation of Mirth. I love it.
to the drawing of himself stabbing another dwarf. And soon after, he actually stabbed him. What an absolute lad. This was also about the time I decided to embark on a haunted biome. And my personal advice? Don't do that. Nothing dies on a haunted biome. The moment you kill an animal, it gets back up. The Jesus. moment you chop off a limb, it gets possessed and tries to choke you. Did you know this applies to shellfish and crustaceans as well? I didn't, but I've just lost a good fisherman to an undead pile of lobster shells. If all of this This is why being a zombie this is why there'd be a lot of bad zombie stuff going on, truly. Sounds like too much to handle? Then you can play Adventure Mode instead. Adventure Mode lets you design and control a single character. Yeah, I love how Crow Man, Chinchilla Man, Eagle Man, Peach Faced Lovebird Man, Intelligent Wilderness Creature that can interact with, influence, and shape the world. Once again, it's impossible to cover everything. So, instead, I'll share some of my character's exploits. The very first character I ever made was a human, locally renowned for his acts of heroism. I didn't know the controls and didn't really care. I spent my entire time accusing children of being vampires and throwing silver at them until they died. No one dared intervene in my righteous crusade against darkness. Incidentally, one of the people I accused was actually Actually a vampire who proceeded to kill me instantly to get rid of not, not a vampire these accusations are completely unfounded I'm gonna murder you to prove that yeah this is why you don't go around accusing people of being very 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 powerful uh, let's just say hypothetically someone were to there were to be severe serious credible allegations that very very rich and powerful people were to let's say engage in some sort of criminal activity let's say they were illegally uh, importing bananas well why would it be a really bad idea to accuse them, even though it's completely true, of importing bananas? Well, the reason is because they have lawyers and they have basically the infinite money hack as far as you're concerned. And so remember, if you get sued by someone, you have to defend yourself or else you automatically lose the lawsuit. That's how it works in the US. And what that means is that if a very rich person wants to, they could spend a million dollars and fund 10 lawsuits against you. Now you need to contract either one very expensive law firm or 10 sort of reasonably priced law firms. So suddenly to defend yourself from that, you need a million dollars in capital or someone to loan you a million dollars. Well, if you don't already have tens of millions of dollars, no one's going to do that. And even if you're going to eventually win the lawsuits, probably, right, The they're, you, you're not going to be able to get back that money and it may take you a decade right what lawyer is going to work for a decade for no pay to defend you against an extremely powerful extremely well-funded uh adversary right and remember these lawsuits don't have to be related to your slander or your uh, uh false accusations of, of banana trafficking so instead they can be related to anything they could sue you for uh, uh, using their um, likeness without permission as a copyright violation. They could sue you for uh, painting your house the wrong color. They could sue you for uh, uh, filing your taxes on time too much. Probably not that, but you know, they could find it constructed or convoluted or sort of made up things to sue you until you're completely bankrupt. And once you can't defend yourself from lawsuits, then you just sort of lose all the lawsuits in a cascade. It's why it, if you reach a certain level of truly phenomenal wealth, you really do gain power over people. If you have a critic, you can actually just sue them until they lose their right to free speech, right? You have free speech until you criticize someone powerful enough to take you to court. Of the evidence, my second character was a kobold who had successfully integrated with modern civilization. To demonstrate how integrated I was, I immediately assassinated the king. To my surprise, the guards didn't even care. My reward for committing regicide was monarchy. I had become the new ruler of this kingdom. I spent the rest of my career spreading rumors that the previous king was murdered 
by myself. Everyone refused to believe it and said I, the king, was full of shit. My third character managed to find a really nice book, a book of necromancy, which I generously donated to one of my fortress libraries. After retiring from adventuring and checking up on the place, I was pleasantly surprised to find the place overrun with undead. Then I got bored and installed some lore-friendly mods. Currently, I'm playing as Vegeta, a local <laughs> Saiyan prince who accidentally used instant transmission to teleport to hell. There, I learned that the wrestling system in Dwarf Fortress is extremely elaborate, allowing Vegeta to choke hold demons while he plucks out their necks. After returning from the underworld, Vegeta spent several hours vomiting on townspeople. Yeah, this seems weird that you have a game that's both civilization building and also you command each individual hand separately. That's also like not a fun mechanic and also a silly mechanic. If you've ever done any real wrestling, you know that, you know, grab right leg with left hand is is l literally there is an entire subfield of jujitsu that is grab leg with hand, right? Like literally you can win worlds by being a leg locker, which is just jujitsu talk for grab leg with hand. You know, in conventional wrestling, it's sometimes called an ankle pick grab leg with hand uh but you know grab grab left leg right hand is not really a, a communicative um way to explain wrestling concepts and indirectly killed a child by doing push-ups later that day an elvish surf refused to yield to the saiyan prince he rejected his generous demands for both of his shoes in exchange for his life now i'm not very good at dragon ball z lore but i don't remember vegeta being able to make destructo discs but who gives a shit in this mod he can no so i decapitated a bunch of elves with energy discs and turned into a giant ape then i got drunk and crawled in the floor stealing people's genitals. In case you haven't figured this out already, Dwarf Fortress is an amazing game. And not only that, it's unique. There's nothing quite like it. It's a sandbox and you make your own fun. And if you get bored of sand, there's a billion mods out there which make the game- Oh god. Like a prehistoric wildlife mod and now with more Australia. Uh, Xenomorph, DF. Uh, Fallout Equestria Redux. Boomsticks and Gatling lasers. Jesus. Dark Ages 3, Peasant and Foresters mod. Game that much Fuck. more intricate and entertaining. Sure, it's hard spacecraft to get it. Spacecraft mod? Did we just see a spacecraft mod? Let's back it up for just a moment. No, spellcraft mod. Okay, I was sure, it's hard to get excited. into. I'm sorry. But then again, so are nursing homes. I give it a perfect score. Perfection is subjective, which is why everyone will see something different or something gay. As always, more content to come, so stay tuned. This video comes out much later than expected. What's up with that, Seth? You lazy schmuck. You've not even taken our money since November. Truth be told, I took a corporate position in December. Then... Oh, he sold out. Damn. I realized I can do a hundred times more by myself. So, I'm going all in. Seth is going full time. A warm thanks to the many members of the Merchants Guild who have been- Oh yeah, definitely look out for your boy Seth. Generously funding well, and bankrolling- Well, that's a lot of Discord messages. Including 11 messages from Bogdanoff. These videos, you're all mm. truly wonderful. I missed the chance to say this before, so... Merry Christmas. Happy Hanukkah. Okay, I don't care about Hanukkah. Uh, this is just him just shouting out the Merchants Guild. What chads? What true chads? Guys, if you are... Uh, okay, if if you want to see the uncensored combat video breakdowns that I do, uh, you want to become a member of my Patreon, right? Uh, that's it. That's it. YouTube hates combat videos, uh, but I do all of these real breakdowns from the Ukraine war. They're fun. They're interesting. And you should definitely 100% uh, join me in my, uh, I don't know, quest to watch them all or whatever. Anyway, here's the Lieutenant Tier patrons. Thanks so much, guys. I'll see you in the next one.